Euromax highlights. Coming up on the show... Happy birthday! British lifestyle magazine ID turns 30. Success Story, a German animated film studio and its award-winning work. And Making Friends, presenting an internet site that brings people together over a good meal. Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin. Merry Christmas and welcome to our Holiday Highlights edition. And maybe you even got some fine perfume in your Christmas stocking this year. Well, if you did, chances are Berlin cocktail mixer Arndt Heisen could serve you up its twin in drinkable form. And that's because he concocts his drinks to correspond to the aromas of fine perfumes. So Euromax went to see how he follows his nose for the perfect olfactory experience. A creative mind behind the bar. 28-year-old Arndt Heisen has been mixing the drinks at Berlin's Sochu Bar for the past two years. He invents new cocktails almost daily because he says just making the old classics is a bore. I'm always looking for inspiration. And once you've gone through all the syrups and all the liquors, you look for something new. And there are so many fragrances out there. Cocktails that taste the way perfumes smell. Arndt finds inspiration in places like the upmarket department store Galerie Lafayette. He's looking for a warm, Christmassy scent to suit his latest creation. From lavender and cardamom to thyme, Arndt is an expert when it comes to sniffing out a perfume's ingredients. Today, he chooses the classic Chalimar a fragrance that French perfume house Guerlain has been producing since the 1920s. It smells really strongly of tonka bean, vanilla, rose, like snuggling up by the fire. And the cocktail to match, how would that taste? Definitely sweet, slightly fruity. It certainly wouldn't be a big drink. It wouldn't go in a long drink glass. It would be served elegantly in a cocktail glass. Making these special cocktails requires more than just liquor and juices. Arndt looks for the right flavors for his drinks in a tea shop. In reality, most of what we identify as flavor is actually scent. We perceive 80% of all flavor through our noses and just 20% through the tongue. Arndt is looking for a fragrant tea with notes of bergamot and rose. A touch of Earl Grey. It should be creamy, because this fragrance is a bit powdery. I'm sure I'll get the right scent. Back to work, right by the Brandenburg Gate at the Five Star Hotel Adlon. The Shochu Bar is on the ground floor. For his newest cocktail, Art is creating an infusion using Japanese shochu liquor and the bergamot rose tea. I let it steep like it would in hot water. Instead of the heat, the alcohol in the shochu extracts the tea's flavors. I let it steep for five minutes, just like normal tea. By then, the liquor has absorbed the flavor. Creations like this tea infusion have given Arndt Heisen a reputation as one of the most creative minds on the cocktail scene. It could be a bit stronger. It needs a fuller quality, and you can use cream to do that. Mixing cocktails is a lengthy process. He takes his time with the taste testing to find the ideal flavor. It's a catastrophe. You don't need to put any cream in this drink. That was a big mistake. Back to the drawing board. No cream this time, and instead of shochu, Arndt uses cognac. Its citrus notes mimic the fresh scent of the Shalimar perfume. Super. It's almost identical. The bartender is satisfied, but what do the guests think? It tastes good. It's not bad. When you think about drinking perfume, you're a bit skeptical. Given that it should be really similar, I think it's a good match. 
Finde ich sogar ganz passend. Mal was Neues? It's something new. It tastes good, like the perfume smells. I think it's good. Richtig gut. The men seem to like a cocktail inspired by women's perfume. But what about the ladies? It's very balanced, a bit sweet, a bit tart, and spicy. And now it's on to the next aromatic creation for Arndt Heisen. Well, long before there were iPods or iPads, there was ID magazine. Founded by British designer Terry Jones back in 1980, it started out as a typewritten, hand-stapled fanzine devoted to the street and youth culture of punk-era London. Well, over the years, it has matured into a groundbreaking glossy, always at the forefront of contemporary fashion. And now Germany's Taschenverlag has traced ID from its pre-digital beginnings to its ever iconic. Present. Colorful, sharp and provocative, ID magazine can look back at 30 years of youth culture. To celebrate, a book featuring every cover the British magazine has ever published. Times have changed, but the trademark has stayed the same. A winking eye on the cover, a visual play on the ID logo. Closed eye, open eye, nose, mouth. Uh, closed eye, open eye, nose, mouth. The playing on ID was, was from the beginning, because we the first ones were graphic. Then to solve the, um, the closed eye, the first cover actually was Lady Die, and I did that with a collage. Um, so I stole uh, a closed eye and stuck it over her open eye. And then from there on, ev everyone had to figure a way to, so, you know. Terry Jones is the founder, publisher and editor-in-chief of ID. During the 70s, he worked at magazines such as Vogue and Vanity Fair before deciding to start up a new and different publication of his own in 1980. And what's interesting is that, you know, there were, there were obviously designers like Vivian Westwood, but she wasn't getting pages on Vogue or Catherine Hamlet, you know, with, there was like very strong designers that were coming out of that period. Um, they were picking up on the, the feeling of that, but... Um, uh, having a magazine that reflected that, that was from a fanzine base, didn't exist. And that was the principle of ID. It was taking a, you know, a fanzine viewpoint at the beginning. The first issue was published in August 1980, with a run of just 2,000 copies. ID's fashion shots were organic, and all about young people with street style. A novel concept then. Today, it's standard fare in every fashion magazine. Well, I, I heard that you one uh, was going on eBay for 500 euro or pounds. I'm not sure. But, um, so um, I like. I always wanted to make a magazine that would be collectible and um, not thrown away. Throughout its 30 years in print, ID has kept its creative freedom by never joining up with a big publisher. It was all about risks and new discoveries and the cover of ID helped jumpstart many celebrity careers. This photo was shot by German photographer Jürgen Teller, a relative unknown at the time. Madonna's cover from 1984 was her first for any international magazine. ID was also an early promoter of model Kate Moss, seen here at the age of 19. It's about portraits, closed or unclothed. It's about people who are interested in people. So that's always our essence. And so it, there's certain, you know, Kate Moss uh, has had more covers than anybody. She just became iconic, I guess. The ID office is located in London's trendy Shoreditch area. Jones's team of young talent helps him keep up with what's current. Most staffers hadn't even been born when the first issue was released. I grew up with ID and The Face, and, you know, I worked at both magazines, and. You know, I was always attracted to working in uh, kind of, you know, youth culture in London. And those were the two magazines to work for. The focus is still on youth culture, but much has changed at ID over 30 years. There was less financial pressure on ID when we started to what exists today. And there was less competition 
for that uh, that kind of everyone wanted to try and put the latest and I would say today it's not always about the latest it's about what you choose in your life and it seems Terry Jones has a knack for making the right choices that's kept ID going for three decades and now there's a special book to mark 30 years of success entitled ID covers 1980 to 2010 well, many women will agree there's nothing like a little jewellery under the Christmas tree. And while diamonds are supposed to be a girl's best friend, many of us, whether for reasons of taste or perhaps price, prefer something more unusual. Well, unique and original. Fit the ticket at the Berlin firm Spreeglanz, where surprisingly mundane objects and materials get dressed up to dazzle. Believe it or not, this sophisticated necklace was originally a bicycle chain. Upmarket recycling. These milk carton seals have been reworked as a filigree chain. A ring made not of diamonds, but a tiny little book. The Spreeglanz concept is jewelry with a difference. The ring is called My Secret Book because it contains secrets. The pages are empty, so you can write down thoughts or poems. Established in 2009, the Berlin-based company gives young designers an opportunity to spread their creative wings, free of financial pressure. Polish designer Kamila Chrobok was one of the first to be hired to spend a whole year working on quirky designs, all expenses paid, with a modest salary thrown in. She's since been joined by a number of other designers who all work on one condition. They have to use unusual materials. The company's concept is very daring and experimental. For many of us, it's our first experience of the working world. We're taking the opportunity to be experimental and develop ideas which perhaps we won't be able to do at a later stage in our professional lives. Because we'll be more at the mercy of commercial considerations. The idea for her bicycle jewellery came to 31-year-old Swedish designer Lina Lundberg when she was cleaning her bike one day. Studded with beads, the bike chains are barely recognisable as such. Her pieces cost up to 700 euros. It sounds like a lot, but they are unique. I think this is very sculptural, also, these pieces, and very three-dimensional, and a lot of movement. And it's nice to, to wear it, and you, it moves with your body. So I would like to create a little sculpture for the, for the woman who, who wants to wear it, I think. Jewelry made from unconventional materials is, of course, nothing new. The famous Nymphenburg company in Munich has been creating jewellery out of the porcelain it uses for its tableware since the 18th century. These days, it works with guest designers. Hamburg designer Sabina Lang favours synthetic materials. Spreeglanz is also partial to synthetics and specifically tetrapack plastic seals. This collection is sold in museum shops all over the world for 360 euros a piece. It depends on what the customer values, what is important for the customer. If it's the idea or the creativity or if it's to show that, uh, oh, I have a lot of money, I can afford to buy something really precious. And if you want that, you should, be, you should buy a big diamond, I think, to really show it. So it seems diamonds aren't every girl's best friend. 
For those with a taste for the unusual, Spreglanz is a perfect alternative. Those of you with small children may well be familiar with a children's story that's been selling like hotcakes for about a decade, The Gruffalo, written by Julia Donaldson. First published in 1999, the book about a fantasy monster has been translated into over 30 languages and now the successful animated film has aired on German TV. And that was good news for its makers at Studio Soy Animations near Stuttgart. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have lunch in my underground house. It's terribly kind of you, Fox. But no, I'm going to have lunch with, uh, with, uh, Gruffalo? Gruffalo. Meet the Gruffalo. He's the monster that inspired an animated film. The crew at Studio Zoe were the ones who brought the character to life. The animation studio, based near Stuttgart, employs a core team of 15 people. The half-hour Gruffalo project was the longest film they'd ever made. The studio's co-founder, Matthias Schreck, was in charge of the technical side of the production. What's special about this project is that all of the elements at Studio Soy came together. We have illustrators, designers, someone who knows how to build these sets. And we have people who are really good with 3D. This project gave us the chance to bring all this talent together. Unlike in many other studios, every step of the animation process happened here. And it all starts with a drawing. These illustrations served as the inspiration for the backdrops featured in the film. Then the studio's own workshop took those drawings and turned them into real sets. This broom was transformed into the branch of a fir tree. And the team spent an entire day sculpting the snow, but the figures themselves came to life via computer animation. You begin focusing on the character, as with design. For instance, you'll start with a walk. Gruffalo is a large character, and he walks slowly, he's lethargic. You really immerse yourself in this world, and then this project is all you think about. The team used a cardboard cutout to check the scale of the character to the background. Then they photographed the set and uploaded those images to the computer. The Gruffalo required about 50,000 snapshots. The Gruffalo monster was originally created by German illustrator Axel Scheffler. Even before the film's release, the children's book of the same name was a bestseller worldwide. The feeling I got when I saw the Gruffalo move was really interesting. I always drew the Gruffalo from the side, so I got to see him from the front and back and every other angle. I really like the film version. It's a faithful adaptation. And I think they did a really good job. The Gruffalo was the biggest project yet for producer Carsten Bunter and his team. Bunter and six colleagues founded the studio in 2002, when they were still students at the film school in Ludwigsburg. There is such a division of labor in animation that it's rare to find someone who can do it all. So it depends how much you divide things up and how many people you find who can pursue a goal together. It's easier if you've known each other for eight, nine, ten years and are aware of one another's strengths and weaknesses. 
The studio's first big breakthrough was the 2002 film Bunnies. Since then, they've received attention on the film festival circuit, especially from movie buffs. The Gruffalo also brought them international recognition and Oscar buzz to boot, but the studio's producer is focused on other goals. It would be great if we could keep working at our studio, even if the projects do get bigger and more specialized. Being able to keep doing the work ourselves and facing new challenges, that would be the best of all. Well, as we continually prove on this program, one of the easiest and most direct ways to become acquainted with another culture is to try out its food. Now there's a new website called Live My Food, which brings visitors from foreign countries together with locals over a home-cooked meal. And we caught up with two Taiwanese students who joined a family for dinner in southern France. Yi Hien Lin and Wen Han Wu have traveled to Marseille for a two-day visit. The two students from Taiwan are studying abroad for a semester in France. Tonight, they've been invited to eat dinner with a French family, even though they don't know them. It's really a special experience to uh, be invited to a local's house, and uh, just like we walk into their life and to, in, to have their maybe special food and uh, also to chat with the locals to understand what they um, daily life is. Daily life in the Jadot family is usually fairly routine, but not tonight. They're hosting a dinner for six people they've never met. Baya Jadot is preparing braised beef à la Provençale. They want their guests to enjoy a traditional French dinner. I wanted to introduce this dish to my guests. It's a dish that takes a long time to cook and it needs to be prepared with a lot of love. I hesitated to make it at first because there are so many delicacies from Provence. And I didn't want to make the traditional fish soup from Marseille, Bouillabaisse, because everyone knows that, and I didn't want to resort to clichés. An hour later, Yi Hien Lin and Wen Han Wu arrive at the Jadot family home. <laughs> the other guests have already arrived. One person from Scotland, two from Germany, and one from elsewhere in France. The Jadots kick off the evening with an aperitif and hors d'oeuvres in the living room, as is usual in France. Among the guests are Lena Zilberberger from Germany and Tom Brami from France, who came up with the idea for the website where tourists and locals can arrange to meet for a meal. We took a trip through Mexico and traveled around with a tour guide. We followed all his tips and, of course, ended up with other French people, actually only French people, in a restaurant. We didn't like it so well and we decided it shouldn't be that way. So they created the website Live My Food. It's been online since October and since then more than 600 people from 30 countries have registered, ranging in age from 20 to their late 60s. They can invite guests from their homes for dinner or be guests themselves. Please come to the table. Everything's ready. Sit wherever you like. Usually the guests and hosts agree on a price for the food and drink before the dinner. After the evening, both sides can rate their experience on the website. Actually, it's much more better than I expect because uh, first is I uh, and uh, but uh, the host and the hostess is really friendly and also the food is good and uh, I feel comfortable although I can't speak French but I can uh, I can uh, feel the way they welcome us the hosts enjoyed it too it was my first time too and it was a very pleasant experience. 
It was like eating together with friends. I think I'll definitely keep this up and really keep using the website and do this again. At the end of the four-course meal, the cheese platter is placed on the table. It's typically French but unusual for the two Taiwanese students. <laughs> and they've had a chance to see France in a whole new light. Eh oui, c'est bon. Well, don't forget you can find our Euromax highlights on our website. So if you'd like to see anything again, just go to dw-world.de slash English slash Euromax dash highlights. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition. Hope you enjoyed them and all the best from us here in Berlin. Bye-bye.